Hi, I'm Jim, N4BFR, and I'm back. I haven't been here since October, but it's nice to be back and doing a COVID-19 update for everyone. Um, this is a special update because this is the half million case edition. Uh, so today, if you combined uh, PCR and antigen test, Georgia passed 500,000 COVID-19 cases, and we'll get into that and how we're counting them and what's going to happen next and where we all go from here. So uh, I even got a few Christmas wishes uh, on the list as we go through. So hope you'll stick around and uh, let's get into the numbers. Today's update, um, I reformatted this since the last time I did a video, so maybe a little harder to read, but let me just take you through uh, the, the stats as you want to know them. Uh, I mentioned the 500,000 milestone that came on the back of 2,034 new cases. Most of those were PCR identified, and uh, if you take a look, that means we had an 18.7% positive test rate. So tests were down, but case numbers were up. So now we've got uh, the highest positive test rate since mid-August. And if you remember correctly, you can see how that uh, hump in the top of the chart there uh, shows uh, our big peak in mid-August, uh, late July, mid-August. And guess what? We are back where we were. So that's uh, where we stand with cases today. It's been uh, a busy week for cases. This is the first day since Tuesday that we haven't had at least 4,800 cases. So we had uh, a five-day streak of 4,800 or better cases of COVID-19. And uh, we drop back down under that today on a Sunday. So uh, we don't get a lot of counting on Sunday. And uh, we've heard from uh, people around the forums that uh, that happens because uh, of the manual way that these are done. And sometimes these are sent in via spreadsheets and people have to be chased and weekends are hard to get the data. So part of the reason why is not necessarily because fewer people are coming down with this on the weekends, but it's harder to get the data on the weekend. So just something to keep in mind as we go forward. One of the things that is pretty consistent because hospital, hospitals run 24-7, 365 is the uh, hospital beds in use data. And right now we've got uh, 24,000, excuse me, 2,542 hospital beds in use. Uh, so said differently, 2,500 plus COVID-19 patients right now actively uh, in hospitals in Georgia uh, keeping uh, keeping our, our people and our nurses and our doctors busy for sure. Uh, that is 12% uh, higher than it was this time last week. Uh, even on the holiday weekend, it wasn't really down last week. So this is a pretty good number, especially when you compare the growth of cases, which was around 15% uh, uh, from last Sunday to this one the bed growth, uh, beds and use growth is about the same uh, increase. So uh, that is interesting. Uh, ICU beds, which is another data point we watch down slightly, that fluctuates more on the weekends. Uh, and that's mostly because of, I don't want to call them discretionary, but the ability to schedule some surgeries, right? Uh, you might not uh, perform a heart surgery on a Sunday. You may say, I'm going to uh, bring somebody in on a Monday, perform it on a Tuesday, and you'd be uh, in the hospital for a couple of days after that, start off in, in critical care, uh, and then go down. How do I know? That happened to me a couple of weeks ago. So uh, it was a pretty intense learning experience. And there's something else that uh, happened to me as part of that experience that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about here in a little bit as well. All right, enough about me. Uh, let's go on to uh, fatality reports. Uh, we had 13 reports today uh, that was uh, above average. Uh, excuse me, not above average, but above last week. So last week uh, we only had 11. Uh, similar thing with chasing uh, reports about uh, how many cases we had. Even harder to chase those uh, death reports. So we always see uh, Sunday as a lower day and the midweek days. Uh, as the higher reports days. And, and we had days this week that were 
uh, eclipsing uh, 70. So uh, 12 is, is really, or 15 is where, 13 is where we are today. Um, I should just look at the number instead of trying to get it off the top of my head. Um, but overall, that makes it 52 deaths a day. That's two deaths an hour around Georgia. That's uh, not a great stat for us, and uh, hopefully uh, that will improve over time. So let's go on to the weekly chart, and uh, I want to show this here real quick and get uh, push this button here uh, and get into that data. So... Um, I mentioned testing a little bit before. Testing was actually down week over week when you look at it from a PCR test perspective. And uh, up until October, that was really all we could look at because that's all the Department of Public Health published was PCR tests. Beginning October 11th, they started publishing rapid test results or antigen test results. And we've got uh, a little more detail on that to show you how much we've been dependent on it. Uh, overall, though, PCR tests down this week. Um, and uh, that meant for, even though cases were up, that meant for a very high positive rate. So 13.5% of our PCR tests, which is the gold standard test, were positive this week, leading us to a total case number of 32,000 plus cases. Now, uh, we had never passed 30,000 cases in a week. So to be at 32,000 is really kind of uh, rocketing off the charts. Um, that's 11,000, almost 12,000 more than last week. Uh, one of the things I wanted to look at was how do we normalize for the holidays? Is there a way to say, can we attribute some of the busyness this week to some of the holidays last week? And you can. However, let, let's just take it as a simple average and take the total 50,000 cases over the last two weeks. Uh, how would that compare to a week-over-week -week growth? Well, I think we had uh, 24,000 cases uh, the week before Thanksgiving. Uh, if you put these together, they average about 20, almost 27,000 cases. So we are, or excuse me, uh, just over 26,000 cases. Quit. Look, just look at the numbers, Jim. Uh, almost 26, 000, over 26,000 cases a week if we average the last two weeks. So one way or another, we're up. We're up in a material way. That would have been made us up about 10%. Uh, and uh, it's, it's scary to see. Uh, we are definitely in a new place uh, when it comes to COVID-19 in Georgia. New hospitalization figure. The thing about this hospitalization number that has always been hard to track, but I keep including it because it's another you know, tool in our arsenal here, this number only counts for people who are hospitalized on the day they are diagnosed. Uh, so a day they have a positive test. So if I come in today and I have a positive test, and I get admitted into the hospital, I'm in this 12, 1,200 number. If I come in to my doctor on Monday and get a test, and I'm positive on Tuesday, but I'm not feeling bad, and all of a sudden on Friday I start to have breathing problems, uh, and he admits me to the hospital, now I am not in this number. I'm in the beds and use number, but I'm not in the hospitalized number. So something to remember as we're, we're looking at this number. Finally, taking a look at the death number, uh, 364 deaths. Uh, you know, we know that deaths trail the number of cases by several weeks. You can see where we started to pick up in late October, early November with the number of cases. So now we're starting to see that death trend uh, increase. I would assume that there are some backlog uh, information in here related to uh, things that didn't get reported over the holiday weekend. Although the holiday weekend uh, death reports or the death reports that came in over Thanksgiving week were not exactly low. So it's it's hard to say, was it a holiday weekend thing? Where did it move? And, and I know that people trying to keep track of this uh, who get paid to do it in the government uh, probably even have a harder time. So... Um, Think of these, again, I think a good way to look at this would be how are we averaging over the last few weeks, and we are averaging up. So that's, uh, that's definitely a way to uh, help uh, give some sanity around the numbers. 
All right, so that's normally that would be typically a place here uh, my, my my normal 10 minute video where I stop and say thanks and go on. Um, but because of the half million case number, I thought it might be good to dive into a couple of additional areas uh, as we go into the next phase. I mean, it, it's been nine months, if you think about it. Uh, the first cases that were really reported were reported on uh, March 5th of 2020, and now here we are on December 6th. So it really has been nine full months of data, uh, nine full months of activity since we've seen this. And, and it's ramped up even, even more than that because... Um, in the first couple of months, you know, th there just wasn't that awareness there uh, that there certainly is now, and it's it's been a part of everyday life. So let me take you through a few items that I put together that I think uh, will help, <clears throat> help you understand where we're at and uh, why I bring up some of the things uh, in the forums and the comments that uh, are needed to to be reviewed. So the first one is uh, I'm calling it PCR versus antigen. 500,000 cases, how do these break down? How do we get to this number? Well, from March 5th through October 10th, all we used, or, or all the state published, we'll say all we used, uh, is uh, was PCR testing. This PCR testing, also called mo molecular testing, is the gold standard. There are very few false positives and few false negatives. So this is the number that most people feel comfortable with. Uh, and as of that point, we had 336,000 cases. On the 16th of October, the Department of Public Health, which we knew had already been using antigen testing, started to publish this data on a daily basis. And the first thing they did was say, hey, by the way, we've been using this. Here's 23,000 that we already counted. So that number went in and we started counting up from there. Uh, if you look at the last, call it not quite two months, uh, I think one of the more interesting things here is almost a third of our cases are being diagnosed by antigen right now. Uh, some days it's lower, some days it's 20%. Um, most days it's 20%. Today it would happen to be 10%. But even if you throw out this 23,000 initial backlog because we don't have dates to put against it, you're still looking at 20% of our cases or 1 in 5 cases being diagnosed by antigen. Now, we know of those 107,000 cases that were diagnosed by antibody or PCR, excuse me, 107 that were diagnosed by PCR, what percentage were positive? So we can even tell the volumes of people being tested, which helps us understand how many people may think they have the virus or may uh, being asked to be tested. And we want to get that percentage down to 5%, uh, then we know it's not expanding. Uh, we have this 57,000 number of people who have had antigen tests, but we don't know what the denominator is. So this could be, 57,000 could, could be of 100,000 tests, which means half the people who take the test are positive. It could be of 500,000 tests, which means 10% of the people are positive. So this is data that uh, the Department of Public Health has not yet published. Uh, we understand that they do have it from other people talking, uh, but this is where it makes it difficult to say how much is the expansion going on. Because during the August and uh, July rush, uh, during the spike, we could really look at the percentage of testing done and be able to say the testing is outrunning the cases or we're not testing enough, those kind of things. Without having the antigen side of this, we don't know completely uh, where the balance of need to test is versus uh, not. Uh, and today, a great point, right? 18% of those uh, PCR tests were positive. Uh, we had a, uh, only a couple hundred antigen positives. How many did we test? Is, it, is that 18% as well? Should we make an assumption that it's the same as PCR? Uh, we just need some idea of places to go. So um, as the dependence comes more on antigen tests, uh, I think the concern becomes more of uh, being able to be completely exposed to everything going on with that. The other piece that I put in here is antibody positives. And this data started showing up in June when the DPH 
uh, had actually been counting this as part of PCR tests and using it as part of the denominator. And when it was exposed, it was a little minor crisis. And uh, the data was actual was the data wasn't taken out of the historical data, but it was started to be reported separately. So what a antibody positive is is it's a positive uh, that somebody has well after they're over COVID-19. So you may have said, hey, I felt sick on this trip. I didn't, I didn't get tested at the time. But while I'm in my doctor's office, can you see if I had COVID-19 previously? They give you a test, comes back in 24 hours, uh, and it tells you if you have the antibodies for COVID-19, uh, which means you may have had the, te the, the, the virus previously. So 37,000 people previously had the virus but didn't get diagnosed when they had it. Uh, but they had COVID, so we should count them in our totals as well. So uh, when you take all these totals all together, uh, you're looking at uh, actually about 530,000 uh, Georgians with COVID right now uh, either have had it, experienced it, uh, and going forward. So uh, something to uh, all, all different elements to be aware of as you're kind of interpreting the numbers. Showed this uh, chart on Reddit a couple of days ago, got some feedback on it, made a couple of changes, but I thought it was uh, good enough to bring back because this kind of helps understand the scope of who's had COVID or who do we think has had COVID in Georgia over the last nine months. And right now, if you, if you and I'll walk you through this uh, chart, but it basically says that one out of every eight people in Georgia has either had a, we suspect has had COVID and not been tested, has had COVID and already gotten over it, or is active with COVID today. So uh, that is a good, solid amount of people uh, to be considering uh, with COVID. Let's start with the first number. 52,000 people confirmed active cases in the last 14 days. All that is is how many cases did we have from Monday to the following Sunday, 52,000, that's the number. But if you think of 52,000 uh, and, and that particular number, uh, that is, um, that's significant. That, that's a lot of Georgians right now. That's one of the higher numbers that we have had over the last few weeks. In fact, 10% of all, remember we're at 500,000 now, right? We just passed 500,000. 10% of all new cases of COVID-19 over the last nine months happened in the last 14 days. We are in a very infectious state right now. The next number is uh, 26,000, uh, 261,000. Uh, and, and I got some data from uh, a friend of mine who does data analysis, and, and he used this assumption of there's probably, a, of all the cases we know that are out there, there's probably six times more cases that we think are out there. And, and this is a conservative number, and I'll get into to another example here in a second. Um, so another 200,000 people walking around right now either are about to be diagnosed because they were at a super spreader event, or they were by their family sitting around at Thanksgiving, or whatever reason, on a plane, went through Hartsfield. You, you, you can make up all the scenarios you want. Uh, but there's another 260,000 people out there that probably have it and haven't been diagnosed yet. Add that to that, another 200,000 people who are possibly active with, with COVID. So uh, we, we know that uh, about six times the number of active cases are likely to have it, uh, but there's also this another plausible group uh, that uh, is, is potentially there. So uh, 209,000, if you combine all that up, now you've got uh, half a million Georgians that are in that uh, have it for sure, probably have it, or are likely to have it. Now, half a million Georgians is one out of every 20. So if you go into the grocery store and see 19 other people, you probably pass somebody with COVID-19. That's why uh, this is as big a concern as it is with these numbers rising right now. Uh, and then this big bar on the right, people we don't know if they've had COVID or if they've tested negative, uh, that's the 9.2 million Georgians right now. Uh, so 12% uh, 
we think at some point in way, shape, or form have been impacted by COVID or will be impacted by COVID over the last uh, nine months, uh, and then this other 87% uh, have not yet. So let, let's hope they stay there and get a vaccine and, and be great. Um, let me go on to uh, just just mention real quick. Um, I, I, I said that the 12% is probably conservative. Uh, there is a site called COVID19projections.com, and I don't know where they you know, kind of get their metrics. What they say for comparison is uh, somewhere between 11 and 25% is the number of people who are either infected right now, have been infected, will be infected uh, in, in these first four buckets that I show on this screen. So somewhere between 11 and 25% is their number. Uh, their their middle-of-the-road estimate is 17%. Uh, I'm using 12%, so I'm probably on the low side, at least compared with them. Uh, let's let's kind of see how this plays out, but um, just wanted to make sure that you all understood a range here and, and that what I'm showing is not an absolute. So uh, if, it, if it isn't 17%, that takes it from uh, 1 in 8 Georgians to 1 in 7 Georgians. So now uh, if you're having a poker game, pretty high chance that one of the folks around the table... Are, uh, has COVID, don't have a poker game. Please, don't have a poker game. Okay. Uh, on to uh, looking at the spikes and and where we could potentially go. So this is, chart's a little complicated. Let me try it and walk through it as best can. The blue line as you see it is what happened in uh, May, June, July, and August. So, uh, so in end of May... Through uh, all of June, we ended up with between 5,000 and 7,000 cases a month. After July 4th, up goes the level. By the time we get to uh, mid, uh, late July, uh, we are looking at 26,197 for a weekly case number. And I believe that was the last week of July or the first week of August. I don't have that right in my head at the moment. Um... Now, so so just stop there and, and, and look at that, 26,197 in blue. Uh, that was the peak of the July-August wave. If we lay that against the trajectory we've been seeing over the last eight weeks of this spike, we're at 32,089 now, uh, but we see a very similar growth curve here. Uh, the 16,548 in red, uh, which is part of our growth curve. That was a, a data dump uh, of some back cases were in there. Uh, the the, um, uh, the 20,188 uh, and the 24,143 uh, combined data dump and Thanksgiving, so that would smooth out a little bit. But if you look at general curves, we have seen an eight-week growth rate very similar to the one we saw in August. So now, where does this go from here? And I'm going to show this chart a little bit differently. Let's take off all of the historical what happened here. If you look at the blue line, once we got to the peak, we started to decline. And it took us about four weeks of plateauing before we really started to get down and, and see the numbers fall off over time. The purple, the purple dotted line assumes the same thing happens. So this is a forecast. If the same thing happens now, starting next week, that happened in July and August, we will see a decline. Uh, we will get about 100,000 more, 100 and, call it 120,000 more new cases between now and the end of the year, uh, and we will uh, start to decline in the thing. So, so that... This scenario basically says this week is the peak. We've had as many as we're going to have as far as the maximum number this week. We're going to start to fall back from here. Generally, not what people are thinking, but it is definitely a possible scenario that you can take a look at. The other scenario you see, the one in the, in the tan dotted line, looks at a site called healthcaredata.org, and they publish weekly expected growth rates. And they've treaded this out for 
four or five months. But what I did was I basically said, what is their, what percentage do they think things are going to grow week over week uh, between now and the end of the year? Uh, and their forecast has it growing by anywhere between 10 and 14% a week over top of where we are today. So going on, if this is the continuation of the spike, uh, we are now possibly going to see uh, another uh, 200,000 plus cases over the next four weeks. We go back to the hospitalization data uh, that's on the... Um, we go back to the hosp hospitalization data here and, and compare these two trends, right? Uh, uh, cases go up, hospitalization goes up. Uh, that happened in July and August. Cases go up, hospitalization goes up. Now, uh, this assumed a, a four-week peak, right? This is, this is that scenario that I saw that says we plateau and then start to go down. So we ended up using about 3,000 beds. But guess what? If, we, if this case here keeps going up, we're going to be in the five, six, seven thousand 7,000 beds in use range uh, if this ties back together. So uh, there's definitely some concerns if that forecast continues. What can we do to keep it from continuing? Don't go out, mask up. I mean, wash your hands. The, the same things that people are saying are really, you know, what we can do right now. Hopefully, uh, people start getting stabbed in the arm or stabbed in the butt with vaccines, and, and that will start to help a little bit. Uh, but it, it's going to be way too early on to see anything material change that way, at least uh, if you listen to people like Dr. Fauci. So um, all we can do right now is say, man, it's gonna, it potentially could get a crap ton worse uh, and we don't want people dying in, in hospitals over Christmas. So it's time to double down on ordering through Amazon instead of going to Walmart and buying uh, and wearing masks versus not wearing masks. So that's really uh, an important uh, thing, I think, going forward. So, you know, all, all of this is is mathematical magic and uh, finger in the wind. So I'm hopeful that this will be the big point. People will go, wow, half a million, that's a lot. I don't want this, and start to mask up. But uh, you never know what's going to happen. Um, let's go on to uh, another chart that I had put together uh, a couple of weeks, or last week, and I got a lot of feedback on it. So I tried to take the same data uh, and uh, interpret it a little bit differently. So in Georgia, in 2019, we know because the CDC counts and they publish the data, that there were just under 90,000 people died in Georgia last year. That's, that's a known fact that people track. Uh, there were 44 deaths by influenza uh, last uh, in the 2018-2019 season for influenza. And it crosses over a year and there's a lot of other things, but... Trust me, 44 deaths. I looked it up. I did the math so you don't have to. It, it's on this chart in a little yellow line, but it's so small uh, that you cannot see it at the top of the chart. It is 0.05% of Georgia deaths in 2019 were from the flu period. I didn't expand it to pneumonia or anything else that it marginally could be. I just used the raw number of flu deaths because we wanted an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. Now, a lot of the time, people are going to say hey, more people die from COVID than die in a car accident. You've heard it before. I've heard it before. We still see it all over social media. So what's the real answer? Well, 1.7% of people died in a car crash in 2019. And guess what? Uh, if we look at the 11-month view of deaths by car crash this year down on the bottom chart, uh, that's a little bit lower, but going to hold fairly consistent, right? Um, so 89,000 deaths in Georgia in 2019, 86,000 deaths so far this year. We've got a month to go, so they will probably end up a little bit over 90,000. Let, let's look at the gray area here. Deaths by anything but a car crash and influenza. 98% of those 
were how people died in 2019. If we look at this now, death by other causes, uh, we're only at 84%. Uh, and that's because of COVID. We have uh, over 10% of people who died this year died of COVID, whether they were listed as uh, confirmed or probable. I included both in that list. Uh, we had 11% of our deaths this year from COVID-19, and that number is pushing 100,000 pretty quick. Uh, we then have this term called excess deaths. So uh, what this is, is uh, if we take the 89,000 deaths from 2019 and average it out for, you know, the, the 16 or 1800 we expect in a week and, and they look at it seasonal and all those kind of things to say, all right, well, we expected anywhere between, you know, 16 and 1700 deaths this week uh, on an average week. Instead, we had 2,100 deaths. We, they would put a portion of those in a group called excess deaths. So if you take COVID, if you take the excess deaths numbers, which is about 12,000, subtract out the COVID-19 actuals, you get another 2.5% of deaths that are unusual for this year. Uh, these could be additional suicides, death by alcoholism, um, Anything else you might think of that may not fall into the normal case, but more people are dying this year than last year. Some of that is unexplained, and that is where this number in red comes in. Finally, flu deaths. We actually had double the number of flu deaths in 2020 that we had in 2019, but still, that was less than 100. So, 94 flu deaths, 9,000 COVID-19 deaths, it... It's worse than the flu. Uh, and then finally, automotive deaths. So I thought maybe this might be a better way to compare and contrast uh, how the deaths were happening and uh, what we were seeing from deaths. So uh, I wanted to put this together, and uh, hopefully uh, this helps folks understand a little bit. This is where most of the data I have for you is done. From here on out, I'm going to be editorializing a little bit and drawing conclusions. So if you don't want to hear that, please uh, give me a thumbs up on the video and enjoy your day. Maybe watch my video of the trains of Bellhaven uh, going through uh, and uh, enjoy your day. Uh, but otherwise, uh, hang in there and I'm going to give you some feedback on what I think and, and what I'd like to see uh, over the next uh, few days and weeks. First of all, I, I'm pro-mask. Uh, I don't understand people who are anti-mask. I, I can't wrap my head around it outside of it's uncomfortable and I don't like it. Uh, because, hey, it's uncomfortable and I don't like it, but here's what I know. If we could get the governor, just his bully pulpit place in society, to say, you have to wear a mask, we're going to go from... 30% or 50% or 60% compliance, wherever we are now, to a higher number. 70, 80, hopefully, if, if we're really lucky. That's going to help stop that spread. That's going to help us not go into the 50,000 case a week level from the 30,000 case a week level. So we've tried it a bunch of different ways. We certainly have given it a long tail effort to say, do the right thing, help us out, and please wear a mask. I think it's time to do something different at this point. If we didn't get a handle on it in July and August by saying pretty please, maybe it's time to, to make a, a, a something different. One of the biggest arguments that I hear for not masking is, well, you can't enforce it. And I'm here to tell you there's a lot of laws we have that we never enforce. Uh, and speeding is probably one of them, right? You can go whipping up a Georgia 400 or down I-16. Uh, and you can go a hell of a long way. And if your car goes 130 miles an hour, you can probably get it that fast. I'm not saying I have because I won't admit that on tape. But I'm just pointing out that it is possible to speed without getting caught because there is just not that enforcement. Uh, same thing, if, if 
we have health laws, but we don't have a health inspector standing over everybody in Hardee's or Subway making sure they make their sandwich right and wash their hands every time. We just have to take these laws and hope that people do the best. And, and I really feel like more people will do better if we have this uh, endorsement from uh, President Trump. Or, um, I'm sorry, I, I don't expect President Trump to do that. If we have this endorsement from Governor Kemp. And I know that people will say, well, it hasn't done as well here or there. And, and that's, that's probably true. Uh, but the more we can do it, I, I, I think the better we are to do it. And there's low risk, right? We're, we know that masks don't make people more sick. So otherwise, um, people in Japan would, would just be terribly sick all the time. So uh, that, is, uh, that is where I stand on that. Uh, finally, a, a little short story here is because of where we're at from COVID-19, there is a large group of people who don't get to see their family in, when they're in the hospital. And I was in the hospital for a week. I had heart surgery. And at 5.30 one morning, I walked into the ER and I didn't see my wife for a week. I was able to message with her on the iPad and stuff, and, and that's something. But when you're going in the next day for open heart surgery, you want to be able to hug your family. And you can't right now because of goddamn COVID-19 and people who won't wear their goddamn masks. So make it a law, make people do it, shame the people who don't, because there's a lot of other reasons for wearing a mask outside of, I don't like it, it makes me sneeze. And you know what? Tough crap. And if you don't like it, leave me a message below and we can have a debate from there. <sighs> okay, I got that off my chest. So that's kind of transitions into um, a couple of things that I hope happen over the next few months. And, and I'm calling them my holiday wish list. Uh, so as we get past 500,000 cases, I think it's time to revisit some of the things we're doing and hopefully improve on them uh, over time. Uh, first one is Department of Public Health. Uh, I think, A, Governor Kemp, let's get him some more money. We can't bring this pandemic in on a budget. Uh, especially when it comes to these kind of things. I'm, I'm hearing that uh, instead of getting more people to help with the numbers, we have fewer. Uh, let, let's fund the Department of Public Health to get it right. Uh, I've also asked that we go back in and much like we're auditing the vote, let's audit what's going on in the uh, Department of Public Health through an outside agency in the state like the GSA. So I'm hoping that that will happen early next year uh, and we can get a better idea and maybe we can find some ways to streamline it. Hey, I've said before, bring in the National Guard if that's what it takes. We have people that can help with this. Uh, let's get the right help to the right people so we can understand where we're at and then make informed facts-based decisions uh, going forward on what we should do and should we reopen or should we require masks and and how many people have been vaccinated that's going to be another number we're going to want to know pretty quickly uh, we need the dph to have the resources to be able to to share that uh, request number two on my wish list for, uh, is to the news media and i mostly only see the metro atlanta news media so i'm sorry if in macon or waycross or savannah or or other places in the state, they're already doing this, but we can't just use the PCR number anymore. We can't just say, well, there were, you know, 100 or 1,800 new cases today. 25% of our cases, uh, and even more, you know, 32% in the data I show, are coming in via antigen. We need to start talking about how big and bad this is and not just uh, ignore that antigen data. So, HAC, Channel 11, uh, WSB, uh, CBS 46, uh, Fox 5. I'm looking at all of you because I've watched you all in the last week and seen how you report, and none of you are reporting the antigen number in any kind of material way. Let's get that lined up, and, and please uh, help us out uh, by getting the whole story out there. Uh, Governor Kemp, I already asked uh, uh, my two things, but just to recap, come on, buddy. Require masks. It, 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 it's not going to hurt you. Uh, and at the end of the day, you could be saving a bunch of lives. Because we're coming up on 10,000 deaths pretty damn quick. And if we could make it 
not be at 20,000 or 30,000 as we go through the surge, so much the more better. And, and for me, it's the deaths I'm worried about more than anything else. Because if you get COVID-19, uh, you are much more likely uh, to have a bad outcome. So right now, uh, let, let's just go back to um, the, uh, the data here. Um, half a million cases, uh, 10,000 deaths. So uh, you can do the math there on, on the percentage. It runs about 2% right now. So you've got a 1 in 50 chance of dying from COVID-19 uh, if you get it. I, I, and, and there's a lot more people... Uh, sorry, that's, that's old data. Ignore that. So there's a lot more people who uh, are getting COVID-19 uh, and uh, we don't want 1 in 50 of them to die. So Governor Kemp... Let's let's try masks. What what do you got to lose, huh? You you show yourself to be open-minded and uh, open to change and and trying new things. P position it like that. There you go. I wrote it for you, Candice. Let let's go ahead and um, give it a try and, and see how it goes. All right. Finally, um, I, I'm just gonna say uh, three things from from everybody who's been so supportive and and watching me all the time. First of all, ha have a great holiday. Uh, I, I know that, uh, we're all going to be staying at home and, and I'm not really thrilled about it because I'm missing my in-laws and I want to see my nephews open their presents and, uh, all those kind of things. But I also know it's way smarter to stay home, uh, than to try and have that little bit of gratification. So, uh, I hope you do the same. Um, I also hope that you all, um, will support me on some of these, uh, items here, uh, and maybe, uh, you know, send a tweet to the governor or, uh, mention something to your uh, local TV station uh, to help uh, do those kind of things. Uh, and then it, if this video has been helpful to you at all, uh, all I'm asking is that uh, you give me a little like and subscribe on the bottom there because uh, for YouTube, that that's what it's all about. And the more people who like and subscribe, the more people that will see this and hopefully the more people that will understand uh, what's happening with COVID-19. And that's really why I'm trying to do this and why I've spent almost 45 minutes on a video today uh, to talk through all the stuff that's going on. Uh, so at the end of the day, that's that's it. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up here and say uh, thank you very much. We, we covered a lot of stuff here. Uh, I know there are going to be a ton of questions. Uh, you see this Reddit URL down at the bottom. Uh, please get in there and uh, make your comments, make your questions. I'm going to post all the charts. Uh, you're welcome to share them out at will. Uh, I, I don't care if I get the credit for them. I just care if it changes people's mind and we start to do things better uh, and we get this COVID uh, case number down, uh, which means we'll get the death number down, which means pretty soon everybody's going to be able to go back to, uh, you know, going to going to Wild Adventure or uh, the aquarium or, or, you know, the beach in Savannah and really just kind of have a normal life again. So uh, let's, uh, let's do that and hopefully uh, we get back to that. In the meantime, uh, thank you very much for watching and uh, I hope you have a terrific day.